epidemic. So I'm going to go ahead and start. And if I can make my slides change. OK, so I want to start with just a, a short description of the virus that causes this illness and a little bit of terminology. So we all hear the term COVID-19, and that is actually the name of the disease. Uh, this was assigned to it by the World Health Organization. The name of the virus that causes it is SARS-CoV-2, and that indicates the fairly close relationship to the SARS virus that caused an outbreak in 2003. Now that term is a little bit awkward and many people don't use it. Some people just call it the COVID-19 virus. Now it is in a group of viruses called coronaviruses. And if you wonder where that name comes from, corona means crown. And if you look at this virus under an electron microscope, you can see a structure on the exterior of the, exterior of the virus that appears, at least to some people, to be a crown. Now you may know that viruses are different from bacteria. They're much smaller. You can't grow them on a Petri dish. They can only grow in living cells or in living animals. And uh, they're divided into two broad categories, DNA viruses and RNA viruses. Coronavirus is in the RNA virus category. The coronaviruses are very common in nature. There are many different variants of coronaviruses. Uh, and they infect many different animals. And the animal that is especially prone to coronavirus is the bat. And you may or may not know this, but there are many different species of bats, and many of them harbor their own or even multiple uh, species of coronavirus. You also may not realize that there are actually seven human coronaviruses. There are four very common coronaviruses that circulate every winter, and cause mild illness, mostly in children. The illness is really more or less like a common cold, and they never essentially cause fatalities on their own. But since 2003, we've experienced three major epidemics with new coronaviruses. The first one in 2002 and 2003 was the SARS virus. That stands for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome. This emerged in China. And then if you may remember spread around the world, there were some 8,000 cases with over 700 fatalities. Fortunately, there was very little penetrance of the United States, but there was major activity in Canada. Fortunately, once very stringent infection control measures were put into place, SARS came under control. And by 2004, it disappeared. We don't really understand that, but We've never seen the SARS virus since that, since 2004. In 2012, we saw a new virus called MERS, a new disease. This was uh, occurring in Saudi Arabia. And I, I neglected to say SARS itself was a form of pneumonia, quite serious, with about a 10% fatality rate. MERS, it turns out, is even worse, and it has about a 30% fatality rate but it is somewhat less contagious than SARS, and it has pretty much stayed confined with a few exceptions to Saudi Arabia. There are still cases occurring in Saudi Arabia. And both SARS and MERS are thought to represent viruses that originated in bats and then moved to specific animals. In the case of SARS, it was an unusual animal in China called the palm civet. In the case of MERS, uh, it's the camel. And most patients with MERS uh, actually have contact with camels and probably acquire the disease from, from the camels. We think that SARS-CoV-2 probably is similar uh, in that it most likely emerged in bats and may have moved into an, an animal. There is a suspect animal called the pangolin, which is also called the scaly anteater. It's native to Asia and Africa. And that may have been the transition from the bat to human beings. So let's just go over a brief history, which occurs, which is all very recent. First cases were discovered in Wuhan, China in December of 2019. You may know that physicians there quickly noticed patients with an unusual form of pneumonia that they recognized as similar to SARS. They almost immediately brought this to the attention of public health officials. There was some investigation. Uh, but somewhere along the line, the investigation was blocked. 
and they really didn't do much with it, unfortunately and tragically. During that time, the virus was spreading. Um, on January 3rd, 2020, the identity of the cause, the new coronavirus, was announced. This was on the internet. And within just a few days, the entire nucleotide sequence of the virus, very detailed view of the virus, was up on the internet. And within one day after that, tests were designed that could detect the RNA of this virus. In other words, could detect the presence of the virus in a person. Now, very quickly also, it was noticed that many of the early cases were workers or people who had had contact with an open air animal market in China. And these are things that are almost unique to China, but they, have, they trade in all kinds of unusual animals, which they use often for food or for medicinal purposes. And they bring all these animals together in open air markets. They are actually illegal, but they are to some extent tolerated and they have not been eliminated. We think SARS emerged in that situation and it appears that, um, that, that COVID-19 did as well. Well, in the weeks following, uh, the disease spread throughout China to all 33 provinces. It was centered in the city of Wuhan in the province, in the Hubei province, and thousands of cases occurred there. It also spread quickly to neighboring countries close to China, then to Europe, and then it became truly global. It's in more than 160 countries at this point. And the World Health Organization officially declared it a pandemic on March 11th. Okay, I checked the Johns Hopkins website this afternoon, and at that point there were 229,000 plus uh, recorded cases, 14,000 deaths, 169 countries involved. These numbers go up every day. Uh, 32,640 cases in the U.S., again, going up rapidly by 10 or more thousand every day. All 50 states are now involved. The current hotspots, I don't have to tell you, are New York, but also Washington State and Northern California. There are 15,000 plus cases in New York State, so you can see that that accounts for almost half of the cases in the United States at this point and more than 9,000 cases of those 15,000 are in New York City. Now, there are actually some success stories so far in control of this virus. And you may think it's funny to put China on the top of that list, and I had some funny feelings about doing that. But once the Chinese recognized what was going on, they put into place very extreme control measures. You probably know they quarantined the entire uh, Hubei province, which is 50 million people. And they were able to turn around the course of this outbreak in every one of their provinces to the point where, according to their current reports, which may or may not be exactly accurate, there have been no new cases in China in the last few days, other than cases uh, related to people coming from outside of China. So it does appear, what I take from this, is that it is possible with sufficiently disciplined public health measures to bring these outbreaks under control. Now also, some of the other Asian countries that are very close to China, Taiwan, Singapore, Hong Kong, Thailand, understood the threat. They were ready to go because they took the lesson of SARS to heart. And they, in the case of Taiwan, they had established a very high level government coordinating agency to coordinate their efforts. They've used very high tech uh, database and informatic systems. They track people on their cell phones. If somebody is in quarantine, they make sure they're staying at home by tracking them on, on their cell phone. And they have limited their number of cases very significantly. They have a very small outbreak in spite of their proximity to China. Similar for Singapore, Hong Kong and Thailand. Too early to tell if this is gonna hold. They are experiencing some increase in cases in, in recent days, so we have to watch that carefully. But again, a very important lesson, and I think what every country should be doing is examining best practices around the world from a public health standpoint and trying to implement those. Um, let's talk about what kind of illness this is. Now, I think many of you are familiar with the idea that many cases are actually pretty mild. It's said that 80 to 85 percent are mild, and these cases would be somewhat similar to the flu. The early symptoms are fever, uh, cough, 
headache. And then if it progresses, people may experience shortness of breath. And then uh, it progresses, if in some cases, but in other cases, it, it just resolves on its own. People are typically sick if it resolves for uh, about a week or so. Now, 10 to 15 per percent of cases are considered moderate, and about 5% are considered severe. And these are very severe cases, often requiring intensive care unit care and resulting in fatalities. We know that this disease is dramatically more severe in the elderly and in those with underlying conditions, especially cardiac and pulmonary, but also cancer, diabetes, and anything that suppresses a person's immune system, whether that's a disease itself or a medication taken for another disease, but a medication that suppresses the immune system. We also know, and this is being seen very clearly in New York, that a number of severe cases occur in non-elderly adults, and almost half of the patients in ICUs right now in New York are actually under the age of 65. Still, the risk is significantly higher in the elderly. Fatality rates among diagnosed cases are under 1% in people under 50, start to climb a little bit into, in people in their 50s, go up to about 3% for people in their 60s, about 6 to 8% for people in their 70s, and 15% and higher for people 80 and older. Uh, the disease does occur in children, but most cases are quite mild. And we recognize that the incubation period, or the time from when you get exposed to when you first have symptoms, varies from two to 14 days. The most common is about five days. So this is the real danger period, but we want people to uh, think about 14 days as the maximum possible incubation period. Okay, I did mention the early symptoms and the possible progression to pneumonia. We also are recognizing now that there may be involvement of the heart, especially late in the disease process. And uh, hopefully you can see the chest x-rays that I have displayed. Um, and the top one uh, is basically a normal chest x-ray or a chest x-ray from somebody with very mild disease. Uh, and the, but the lower one, is what happens in the people with very severe disease. And you don't have to see a, be a physician to see that something very bad is happening in both lungs of that patient. And that patient would probably be uh, either on a mechanical ventilation or very close to it. And that's what happens. People become unable to uh, breathe, unable to get the oxygen into their system that they need. They have to be, uh, be have an intubation or a tube put into their trachea and mechanical ventilation, and uh, hopefully that can, can uh, get them through the disease, but unfortunately it, it doesn't always. We are in the serious position we are in with this disease because there is no established treatment and we do not have an, a vaccine. This is a new virus that we've never had experience with before. There's a experimental drug called remdesivir, that is very active in the laboratory, but it's just starting to be used in, in people. It has not even begun through to go through an FDA approval process, but it is available under certain circumstances of clinical trials or what's called compassionate use, where the company that makes it is allowed to release it on an individual case basis. Now, people are trying out various drugs that are already approved by the FDA and one that has gotten some attention because there was some thought that it might be active against MERS as well is an HIV drug called Kaletra. But a study recently came out in the New England Journal suggesting that Kaletra probably was not very effective. And then you've probably heard some of the talk about the anti-malarial drug chloroquine or its close cousin hydroxychloroquine, which is used for lupus and some other forms of arthritis. And, um, these drugs may have some antiviral activity, but it's really too early for us to know if they have a role in treating patients with, uh, with COVID-19. We don't have a vaccine for this disease. Uh, we have candidates. People were working hard on vaccines for SARS and MERS, and they very quickly tried to adapt those vaccines to uh, COVID-19. And actually the first candidate has already uh, begun a clinical trial. But as Anthony Fauci from the NIH has emphasized, 
Under the best scenario, it will be 12 to 18 months before a vaccine can be determined to the satisfaction of the FDA, and that's for our protection, to be safe and to be effective and to be produced in large, in large amounts so that it can be distributed to the population. So we have to go through this season without a vaccine. Um, let me say a word about testing. We do have a test for this virus. It's performed on a nasal swab. The test itself requires only a few hours once the test gets to the laboratory. Um, and I do want to make sure you understand what the test does and what it doesn't do. So the test shows the presence of the virus. And remember that I talked about an incubation period of two to 14 days. At the beginning of that incubation period, the test will not be positive. But one to two days before the person develops symptoms, remember I said the common, that common incubation period might be five or six days, so at three or four days after exposure, the person may start to have a positive test. And this probably also means that the person may be contagious at that point. So one of the realities of this infection is that people are probably contagious for one to two days before they have symptoms, uh, at which point they have no way of knowing uh, that they might have the disease. Now the test then will be positive and it'll stay positive while the person is sick and probably for one to two or more weeks afterwards, the person may not be infectious for that entire time. That's, some, that's an unanswered question about this disease. But if you just go and test the general population using this test, the negative results will be entirely meaningless because they just mean that the person doesn't have the disease at that very moment in time. But the next day, if the person is, is incubating the disease, they may become positive. So the test really is a tool mainly for evaluating a person with symptoms to determine if those symptoms really are uh, COVID-19 or not. And it is effective for that purpose. You all know that um, we ran into problems nationally with the availability of tests, that this was un very unfortunate, um, but tests are now coming online rapidly. We still have problems in that some of the components of the tests are becoming, are hard to, to acquire as we scale up. Hopefully that will, uh, will come under control shortly. We also have a second bottleneck, which is not the performance of the test, but obtaining the sample. You have to go someplace to have the nasal swab done. And many facilities are not experienced with obtaining nasal swabs from adult patients. And they also don't necessarily want to be deluged with a lot of individuals who might have the disease. So the approach is to set up specialized test centers, even drive-by centers that people can come through. And again, I think that is still not adequate, but increasing rapidly. And I think we'll see a rapid increase over the next few weeks. So our control measures in this situation where we don't have confirmed therapies and we don't have a vaccine are mainly behavioral control measures. We have to do everything we can to detect cases so we know where they are, isolate them as quickly as possible, figure out who they exposed and try to track those people and get them into uh, self-quarantine. We also have to carry out what's referred to as social distancing. I think you've all probably become aware of this concept. People need to stay apart from one another and as much as possible. Ideally, stay at home and don't see anybody outside of the home. That's, that's ideal. We cancel large events because any large event can serve as a terrible amplification point for this virus. The SARS virus had what were called super spreader events where one contagious person infected, in some cases, hundreds of other individuals. So if you, you can imagine that if there's a large event like a sporting event and one person is there who's infectious, many other people could be infected. This is tragic. And so that's the reason why it's been very important to cancel large events. People are encouraged whenever possible to work at home. And we've canceled schools because we know that even though children um, don't, for the most part, don't get sick with this disease, they actually can become infected and can transmit it, we believe, to other people. Let me close by just talking about what we mean by quarantine 
and self-quarantine. So if a person has this disease, they would be under mandatory quarantine. That might or might not be done on a legal basis, but most jurisdictions do have the ability to achieve a legal quarantine where it has the force of law. But initially, typically, they rely on the person to stay, stay in their home and not expose any other individuals. Ideally, they should be in their own room in the home and they should have their own bathroom if at all possible. When they, if they interact with other people in the home, they should always be at least six feet away from those other individuals. And those other individuals also have to be quarantined. And there we get into the concept of self-quarantine. An individual who has been exposed to a confirmed case or a highly suspect case should also go into quarantine. We call this self-quarantine, but it's very important to adhere to it. And that requires 14 days, the maximum incubation period, in the home without seeing other individuals. There's some disagreement among authorities about whether people can go outside, but if they do go outside, they must stay away from all other people, no socializing, Oh, just a solitary walk. Some authorities in Israel, for example, they say, no, do not go outside uh, at all. And this must go on for 14 days. And these are the tools that we have at our disposal. I actually think that if we really apply these tools very, very vigorously, that they will have an effect. Right now, it's too early to tell, especially in New York, because events are unfolding and uh, we're talking now about new cases that are the result of infections that occurred a week or more ago. Um, and also we have testing coming online, which will increase the, de the detection of, of cases, even if there were no new cases. So we're sure to see increased numbers over the next couple of weeks, and it'll make it difficult for us to know what's really going on with the epidemic. But I think we'll have to look at numbers of cases admitted to the hospital, people admitted to ICUs and, and deaths and to monitor this outbreak. But I am hopeful uh, that, that really, really strict uh, social distancing can have the effect of, of modifying the course of this very bad epidemic, which has tragic consequences for individuals and extremely serious uh, consequences, as I think we all know, for our economy. And that is another reason why we must bring this under control as rapidly as possible, no compromises. So I'm gonna stop there, turn the electronic podium over to Betsy Shore-Levy, and then we'll take questions. Okay, great, Dad, thanks so much. That was terrific. Um, so our second speaker tonight is Dr. Betsy Shore-Levy, whom I'm proud to say was a former colleague of mine at the 92nd Street Y, and someone whose advice I have turned to frequently um, regarding parenting and child rearing issues myself. Um, Dr. Levy is a licensed clinical psychologist who has a PhD in psychology from Columbia. She has a full-time practice in New York City where she has been a psychotherapist for over 30 years. She lectures and teaches in New York City and Philadelphia, and is an adjunct faculty member in the Clinical Psychology <laughs> Teachers College at Columbia University. Her areas of clinical specialty include, but are certainly not limited to depression and mood orders, anxiety orders, child development, interpersonal relationships, and the development of self and self-esteem. She lectures and teaches in and has been the consulting psychologist for the 92nd Street Y Nursery School for 25 years. Dr. Levy. Thank you so much, Rachel. I am thrilled and honored to be with you all this evening. I would like to thank your father, Dr. Storch, for that excellent, clear, comprehensive presentation of COVID-19. I actually learned a lot, took my own notes, and to be in um, a presentation with, with your dad, Dr. Storch, is an honor for me. Um, I would also like to welcome to my home, which is now my home office, the Fifth Avenue Synagogue community, um, which I have by family now become exposed to and a part of and so very much enjoy. So with that, I think I will begin. 
Um, please excuse any notes that I have. Um, as one can imagine, I have never been before prepared a lecture on COVID-19 because it did not exist. So this may be my first of many, I hope, lectures, not many, I hope, I hope it's over, um, on COVID-19. I'd like to begin with a piece that I saw on the internet, which so, is so telling because the internet and everything online has become our most significant way of communicating with one another and transmitting information, critical information. When this is over, may we never again take for granted a handshake with a stranger, full shelves in, at the store, conversations with neighbors, a crowded theater, Friday night out, a taste of communion, a routine checkup, the school rush each morning, coffee with a friend, the stadium roaring, each deep breath, a boring Tuesday, life itself. When this ends, may we find that we have become more like the people we wanted to be. We were called to be, we hoped to be. And we, may we stay that way, better for each other because of the worst. So I'd like to begin there this evening. And um, I welcome you to take some notes while I'm speaking so you can remind yourself if you have questions for myself and Dr. Storch thereafter. The COVID-19 pandemic is certainly a new normal in our country. And while we've all been using the word new normal quite lightly, I want to explain what a new normal means psychologically for our environment. The streets outside, I, I can attest to that here in New York City, are silently eerie. People appear distrustful, cautious, suspectful, afraid, nervous. It's different than the feeling of walking down the street just three weeks ago. Our schools are closed, our gyms are closed, our churches, our synagogues, our theaters, the movies, any public place where we go to enjoy human life, including bars and restaurants. One of my favorites is right there. They're all closed. This is not life as we know it. And not only that, they're closed indefinitely. So we don't know when to prepare ourselves psychologically for life to begin again in the way that we knew it. This is not our life, nor is it the life that human beings are wired for. And this is most important. We are not wired to quarantine. We are not wired to socially isolate. The human condition is a social condition, and that is how we thrive. Interpersonal connectedness, our communities, and life in our society are the foundation of our mental health and our psychological well being. That foundation is most certainly being threatened with COVID 19. What have we lost? A simple salutation to a friend at morning drop-off at school. A good morning or have a nice day to a local merchant. The touch, and I underline the word touch because tactile connection is so important. The simple touch of a friend, a quick hug, a quick kiss or embrace, playing with a cute puppy, on the street, stopping a woman with a stroller, 
asking to help. These were all new normal behaviors. I'm going to take a risk and call them mood stabilizers, mood enhancers. They don't exist right now. They did three weeks ago. They don't exist today. But if they do exist, they ex exist virtually at best. And this is where we learn that that fast paced, quick, technological advance that overwhelmed us all and invaded our privacy is now our best friend. So I wish it did take COVID-19 to teach us this. But as you said earlier, Rachel, we're all gonna have to learn more about and embrace technology. Why are we so much af more afraid of COVID-19 than we are of the flu? The flu comes every year. It kills approximately, or more than, 30,000 citizens of our country. And globally, it kills hundreds of thousands. And we can't stop it. We can treat it by vaccine, but that doesn't mean we don't get ill. So why are we so much more afraid of COVID-19? Well, COVID-19 is brand new. We don't know how to cure it. We don't have a vaccination. We are scared. We are left with no control, no devices, nowhere to turn. We don't know its fatality rate exactly. We don't know its longevity. We don't know how to treat, and we don't know how to avoid it. Aside from the very important measures we've all learned about hand washing, not touching your face, social distancing, wiping with Clorox wipes, yes. But does that prevent COVID-19? I think Dr. Storch will tell us no, unfortunately. This is an entirely transmissible disease when one is asymptomatic to another. That is scaring our community. There is no sense of personal control, and I cannot emphasize this enough. Control fosters a sense of relief for most people. You take away our control, we panic. And that's where we are. So the effects of COVID-19 on mental health, while they have not, and I, I underline not, been systematically studied, we do not yet have research. We know what to expect. And this I want to share with you. We expect sheer anxiety. We expect panic. We expect all the fear that you see when there are not modalities for intervention. So there's so much that we don't know, but let me tell you all tonight what we do know. I like to focus on what we can hold on to as we're becoming an increasingly anxious population. We know that our daily mental health will be challenged if not compromised, and we can expect it and be prepared and put on our bulletproof vests that they'll only work sometimes. We know it is normal to experience changes from day to day. Changes in sleep, very important, in eating patterns, very important, panic-like symptoms, phobia-like symptoms, anxiety, sadness, depression, fear. We can expect hoarding behaviors from those who have not been diagnosed with hoarding disorders. We can expect extreme anxiety from people who have suffered from obsessive compulsive disorders, from germ phobias, from contamination phobias, from generalized anxiety disorder, from separation disorders, we can expect real vulnerability in those areas of mental health vulnerability. 
in prolonged periods of isolation, people often turned inward. And this is what I describe as the new normal. There is more rumination, more introspective thought, more thinking. And while you say more thinking, more ideas, more conclusions, more, more research, in the individual human being, more thinking, more rumination means more inwardness, more depression, more obsessive compulsive symptomatology. It's not the inward thinking that we're delighted by in the creation of a brilliant poem. It's anxious inward thinking. Those are very different things. This uncertainty this helplessness about the future, we're all wrestling with it at best. We feel frustrated because we can't help those on the front line. In many crises, we find ways to get to the front line or get to those on the front line. In this crisis, we're struggling to protect our first responders. We're struggling to protect our doctors, our nurses, our health care workers. They're at risk. We're worried about them, but we can't live without them. We know that older people who are near to dear and dear to many of our hearts, we know they're at great physical risk. And we know that if they're alone, their health may suffer and we need to get to them and in many cases, we cannot. Again, this new normal is a scary way to be, but there are silver linings and I will get to them quite shortly. We know that, each, that this new normal is a strain on patience. Please listen to the word patience because you're gonna need a lot of it in the next few weeks, hopefully not months. We know it, it's going to challenge our resilience. That's the best thing we have, being a resilient population. We know it's going to challenge periods of despair. We'll have better days. We'll have worse days. We'll feel optimistic. We'll feel pessimistic. I, I hope that Dr. Storch will check these numbers while I'm speaking, but I believe that 29% of people who suffered from SARS experienced post-traumatic stress disorder, better known to all of us as PTSD. And I bet a lot of us are beginning to experience it right now in our homes. We know that over 31% of Ebola survivors showed symptoms of severe depression. We know those at highest risk. As Dr. Storch said, the elderly, those with pre existing medical conditions, and pre existing psychiatric conditions. I think I've described this as generalized anxiety disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, contamination disorders, etc. We know that loneliness leads to de detrimental mental physical and muscular skeletal health. These are facts that we know. We know the economy is in a terrible state. We are scared for our jobs. We are scared for our families. We are scared what the economic world will look like when we return to our jobs, if we have those jobs. That's, that's, that's big, that's putting food on the table. That's paying to see a doctor. Many have said that COVID-19 mimics the stages of grief. That would be shock and then denial and then sadness and then acceptance. What gets more to our core than thinking about grief and loss? Freud des described humankind in a brilliant way. He said our drives motivated us to love and to work. Well, now, Dr. Freud, we need to love virtually and work virtually. 
and work at home. I, from my readings of Freud, strongly believe this is not what he had in mind. So, what can we do? Where is the silver lining for all of us? The CDC has told us that everyone will respond differently. We agree. The CDC has told us who's at risk. We've discussed this, the older pre-existing conditions. We haven't discussed children and teens, first responders. And what are the behaviors the CDC describes? Worry about our own health, health of our loved ones, health of our family members, difficulty sleeping, difficulty eating, difficulty concentrating and focusing, which will not help us to work virtually and without the structure of other colleagues and employers, chronic health problems, which may get worse, and, and very, very importantly, an increased use of tobacco, alcohol, substances, and an increased incidence of relapse for those with addictions. And this is a, I am begging those that deal with addictions so well to bring their conferences virtually to our homes. And so, as I asked just moments ago, how do we regulate this stress and anxiety caused by COVID-19? Here are some suggestions. Please jot down any questions you have. Reduce and regulate your overexposure to the news and to social media and to all that is out there 24 seven about COVID-19. The human being cannot take being this immersed in fear and bad news. If you are working from home, perhaps you like the eight o'clock news. I like the six o'clock news, not that I'm ever home to make it, but I am now. I like the six o'clock news. You don't need to watch the news in between. Turn the television off. If you work by computer all day, turn off your alerts. You don't need to be alerted all day to the next potential catastrophe. Stay connected, stay educated, stay informed, but do not stay overwhelmed and over immersed in this, in this COVID-19 pandemic. Exercise, exercise your own body, exercise with others. Take yoga classes online, stretch, breathe, learn how to stretch and breathe online. Eat well and eat regularly. Maintain the way you eat. If you're gonna graze all day at home, graze on carrots and celery, graze on healthy vegetables and fruits, and then have your regular meal. Try to have it with those you're quarantining with so you have interpersonal discussion, you look eye to eye, you share your meal. All over the country, all over the world, people like to share their meals. Sleep. Sleep is critical for mood regulation. Think about how irritable you are when you don't sleep. Sleep is critical for cognitive functioning. You're gonna be asked to work fast and virtually. You need your brain. Get sleep. Implement routine into your life. This is a new routine. Get up in the morning, wash your face, change out of your pajamas. Have some breakfast. Get ready for work, so to speak, if you're a working person. If you put on a little makeup, that won't hurt either. Get ready for your day. And when your day ends, turn your computer off and say, I have finished my work day. It is time to relax. I can put my pajamas back on. Structure and routine keep us well. We need predictability. We can't be lost. There's a funny thing on Instagram 
about where to go for the weekend. And it simply puts up the floor plan of your apartment or house. We can't go anywhere. And I responded to the Instagram saying, we all choose the kitchen. Keep the same routines with those you can be quarantined with. Your landscape for socialization is your home. Okay, here's the big one, everyone. Avoid social isolation as best you can. And I came up with words for you tonight that I hope you'll all write down. Social isolation, social disengagement. It doesn't mean social disengagement. And there again is our friend, the computer and technology. This may be the most important theme of my words tonight. Social engagement strategies. Group texts with friends. I'm loving that. I have two group texts going and I share information between them when it's critical. I've learned how to have a shrink on it. I've learned what the New York Times said this morning. I've learned all the poetry I'm going to share with you tonight. Group texts are wonderful. Group chats are wonderful. Chats and texts with colleagues so they don't just become these colleagues you're not interpersonally connected, connecting to. What about a joke to a colleague? What about how are you feeling to a colleague? Social dates online. I hear of young couples who are putting their children to sleep, turning on computer, having a meal or perhaps a glass of wine and talking about their week, much as they would at a restaurant. I hear it's been quite successful. Visualization techniques. Where would you love to be now? What calms you down? I would like to be on the beach in the Bahamas. It calms me down every time. I picture my children there. I picture my parents there. I feel good. Meditation. I can't say enough for meditation. Reach out to the David Lynch Foundation. They'll teach you in any way that you want. Meditation does wonders. Breathe. Go to religious services. You can't go to synagogue or church. Join the religious services online if they are meaningful to your life and your spiritual life. I think I said exercise. If I didn't, I mean to repeat it. Um, exercise together, exercise with friends. Only friends you're quarantined with, but friends online. I have a couple of friends who went down in their basement yesterday and went online and did a dance party. That was wonderful. I was so jealous I was not with them. I'm sure they're all listening now. Right, other than exercise, get a stationary bicycle, a stationary golf, golf putting mat. Those are really fun a slide for your children to go down, a basketball hoop, books, cooking projects. We all love to cook together. Learn new recipes or just cook your favorites. Rachel, I guess that's the banana bread that you share with me all the time that I tried to make the other night. It was not as good as yours. Puzzles, board games, Monopoly, Clue, art projects, drawing, painting, piano, music. What's better for the soul than music? Practice your violin, practice the piano, learn the cello. I say that for my grandson, Jasper, learn the cello. Take up a new language if you've always wanted to. Take Spanish or French or Portuguese or, or Italian online. What could be better? Write a diary, write a book, write a diary about your experience of COVID-19. Stay 
connected. And this is for all of us, both those of us who seek mental health help treatment and those of us who do not. If you are in couples therapy, family therapy, individual therapy, group therapy, CBT, DBT, no BT, reach out to your mental health provider. They are there for you. They are Skyping. They are FaceTiming. They are Zooming like we're doing this evening. They are on the phone. They won't let you down. They, you are the people they spend their life learning from and learning about. Reach out to your mental health providers. If you know your loved ones need to, need to reach out, encourage them. This is a time of crisis. If you see someone at home who seems to be losing impulse control, seems to be acting really strange, very depressed, very manic, their judgment is now impaired, you're scared. Maybe they're not scared so much, but you're scared for them. I'll say the same thing that I say in my office when it's not COVID-19. Call 911. Never hesitate. When in doubt, call 911. We are New Yorkers. We stand up to the plate. We work together. We bond. We have lived through 9-11 as a city with our leaders together. New Yorkers survive. We will survive COVID-19. I'd like to read you something very positive. I promise to get to the positive. That Erica Commissar, who frequently writes for the Wall Street Journal, posted during COVID-19. In this article, she focused how much children and their parents are enjoying their time at home together. And she wrote, as anxiety and fear settle over the world, there is a silver lining to this pandemic. In a self-occupied world, the coronavirus is making people reassess their priorities and values underlying values. The United States is one of the hardest working countries in the world. The emotional well-being of America's productivity is coming at a price to the parents and children. She suggests we begin to question the values of our society. That is, do we need to be into work when we could have walked our children to work and we won't see them perhaps for three days? Do we need to come home really at 11 o'clock when the work can wait till the next morning? So I'm hoping that COVID-19 will help us all as a country to reassess some of our values. Maybe then it won't be so shocking to go from all to nothing. Okay, I'd like to change sets for those of you in the audience who are parents or grandparents, aunts and uncles, teachers, educators. How do we talk to our children and our teenagers? Let's talk about children first. First of all, don't assume anything. Ask first. Ask what your children know. Ask what their fears are. There is a rumor going around the playground in New York City that if you dig deep enough, you'll get to China, and oh my goodness, you'll get to the virus, so don't dig deep in the playground. That is not real. Children need real information. What they fantasize about is worse. Their anticipatory anxiety is worse. Children need real facts and reassuring facts and honest facts. They need to know that their parents are taking every measure to keep them safe and protect them from this, this illness, this virus. They need to know this is new. We all need to be careful 
together, mommy and daddy, your teachers, your aunts, your uncles, your grandparents, we're all protecting you. That doesn't mean we can all visit you. We can talk online. We love in our hearts. We love in our souls. Make sure you take into account the developmental level of your child, that you're speaking at a level that doesn't terrify them, at a level they can absorb and understand. Do not increase anxiety in young children. They're not equipped, they're not yet equipped to deal with anxiety as we are. And an extra point, if you are going to talk to your children about COVID-19, please talk to them in the daytime. Talk to them before they are exhausted, before they will distort your words. Lunchtime is perfect. Saturday lunch, my favorite time to talk to children. They will distort in the evening and it will transfer into their dream life and the unconscious. Spare them that, that pain. Neutral language, neutral words. My patients know I love the word neutral. Don't use scary words. Use real, honest words. Germ is not a scary word. Virus, in some contexts, is a scary word. We might die is a very, very, very scary word. And if your children ask, will we die? The chances are no. We are doing everything to keep you and the people you love safe. And so are our leaders and our doctors. If kids can ask you questions and you're feeling anxious, answer the question at a different time in the day. Don't discuss anything when you're particularly anxious. If you've just learned a dear friend has COVID-19, that's not when to answer your daughter's or son's question. Keep that in mind. But do acknowledge their fears. This is scary. Do acknowledge their fears of not going to school, of what the world is going to look like. Be as reassuring as you can. You cannot dig to China. You cannot go get COVID-19, let's hope, on the swing set or in the slide in your living room, to be sure. Before I take your questions this evening, I'd like to read you um, something that a friend shared with me. It's a poem by Kitty O'Mara, and it's based on an Italian poem by Irene Vella. Some of you may know her. It goes as, and the people stayed home and read books and listened and rested and exercised and made art and played games and learned new ways of being and were still and listened more deeply. Some meditated, some prayed, some danced, some met their shadows and the people began to think differently and the people healed. And in the absence of people living in ignorant, dangerous, mindless, and heartless ways, the earth began to heal. And when the danger passed, and when the people joined together again, they grieved their losses and made new choices and dreamed new images and created new ways to live and to heal and heal the earth as they has been, had been healed. And with that, I wish you all health, some companionship, a safe quarantine, a safe family, and ultimately, let's pray for peace for a safe world.
Thank you very much. It was my honor to be with you tonight. Betsy, thank Betsy, you. Thank you. So I my so pleasure, I think Rachel. We can go to some questions now. Um, the first question I'm going to pose is um, actually from Rebbitz and Lisa Babbage. She typed it in. And here's the question How can a pandemic end? It seems like there's no way out. Even once the numbers go down, won't people going out create the numbers to go up again? Okay, sounds like that's for me. And pandemics do end. We've had influenza pandemics and they do um, peter out after a while. One thing that happens is gradually people, people become immune to the infection and then the virus doesn't have as many people to infect. And when that number gets high enough, the activity will go down. Some viruses are affected by the climate and the seasonal change may, uh, may eliminate the virus. So this will go away. Exactly what the time course will be, it's too early to tell, but we will get ahead of this. Okay, um, let's see. So you can now type a question um, if you would like, and I can read it out. Um, and if you give me just a minute, I'm gonna try and activate the raise hand feature so that you can um, be enabled to ask your questions. Rachel, yes. while you're activating that, maybe the rabbi and I can share the wonderful learning we had this morning about how to socially engage in COVID-19. There was a family bris in the Blimbaum Markovici family this morning, and people joined this bris throughout the world, not just throughout the country, and we're able throughout our world to celebrate blessings together. And I didn't want to close tonight before the rabbi and I had a chance to share with you that our blessings still can be celebrated and with virtual reality, even more so. So this Dr. Seuss piece that came across saying, Oh, the places you won't go, which broke my heart, is not true. This is right now during COVID-19, we will continue to go many places. Thank you. I also want to mention that someone pointed out to me that social distancing is really incorrect. It's physical distancing, but you can be socially connected in, in the many ways. Absolutely. Many Thank you, Rabbi. That was such an important point. Okay. So um, I'm having a little trouble activating the questions, but I've had several submitted that people have typed in. So I'm going to go ahead and read those myself. I apologize for my lack of um, being able to navigate this. And feel free to type in through the chat any questions you have, and I'll, I'll read them out loud. So the next question is from Yisrael Shulman. How long does the vi virus survive on surfaces, and how long does the virus survive in the air? Okay, thank you for asking that question. And um, unfortunately, this virus is somewhat more persistent in, in the environment than some others. And the experiments that have been done um, show that the virus can stay alive on some surfaces for some hours or even some days. And one experiment even as long as nine days, although that probably is not typical. Now, I do wanna say that we don't know for sure that the virus on surfaces is actually transmissible to people, but I think it behooves us to be very careful about environmental contamination and do what we can to disinfect the environment. The good news is that this virus is very susceptible to standard disinfectants. So a diluted solution of Clorox, a diluted solution of ammonia, alcohol, all are very effective at inactivating this virus. So if there's a surface that you think might have become contaminated by somebody's respiratory secretions, then clean it off with, wipe it down with one of those disinfectants and uh, that should take care of it. Okay, thanks, Jeff. 
Um, the next question, once someone has COVID-19 and then recovers, it sounds like the consensus is that they won't get it again. Is that true? And if so, why? Well, we're getting great questions. That's a very important question that is not answered at this time. In most viral infections, there is immunity after people recover, but there are exceptions. And we don't know where this one falls. There, many experts are somewhat optimistic that people will be immune after recovery, at least for a period of several years. But that's still a research question. As we go further into the epidemic, we should get an answer on that. Okay, thanks, terrific. Um, here's the next question. New York has 15 times more cases than any other state. Is that because New York City is such an urban, heavily populated area and there is more human interaction? As a follow-up to that, would you recommend moving to a more rural area if possible to better distance from people? Okay, these are good questions. And um, I think, of course, uh, New York's large population and the extensive interactions that New Yorkers engage in, I think probably have a lot to do with um, with uh, the fact that New York is ahead of the pack in this outbreak. To some extent, this, this can be accidental. Uh, Washington State, for example, is another center uh, that may have to do with the fact that it's on the Pacific coast and there were, was more possibility of exposure uh, from China, but uh, accidental events can, can play a role here too. Um, and the second part of that question was, would you recommend moving to a more rural oh, moving area? to a rural area? This is a difficult question. Um, let me say that I think it is possible to maintain safety in New York. If remember that your home is safe, and if you can stay at home, and the people in the household as much as possible stay at home, you will be safe. The biggest point of vulnerability is going out shopping and. Anything you can do to limit that is important. If you can shop online and have food or other things delivered, that's so much the better. If you have to go out shopping, then one person should be designated to go. It should be a person who's not in a high risk group and the person should make an effort to go to the store at the time when, it, when they expect it will be least crowded and get in and out as rapidly as possible. For people who have the option to move completely out of the city, um, that might be uh, might be possible, might be advantageous. But they will still have to maintain the same precautions and maintain. Um, I like the rabbi's term, physical distancing from people, because I think we're going to see that this uh, this virus will spread around the country. So, um, Dad, there's a related question from somebody else, but I'll go ahead and ask it now. Um, and that question is. What about deliveries? So even if the delivery man or friend leaves something outside your door, can the germ still be on the bag? Well, I would have to say that that is a possibility because we know that the virus has some stability in the environment. We don't know for sure how effectively that is transmitted, but I think you sh should not take the chance. And so the thing to do is to have the delivery man uh, put the, the material outside the door. It's better not to interact with the delivery person directly if possible. And then have some alcohol or bleach wipes or Lysol wipes and wipe down the outside surfaces of the material before uh, as you bring it into the house. And okay. then after that, if you have gloves, you can wear gloves for that process. If you don't, be sure to use hand sanitizer or wash your hands immediately when you finish the disinfection process, just in case your hands got contaminated. Okay, terrific. Um, here is another question and comment from someone. And this person says, I just wanna say that being alone is not the same as being lonely. And here's the question. I am sewing masks to be filled either with, a, either, with either a Swiffer or a HEPA air conditioner filter. I was told that these masks are as good as the N95 mask, is this true? Uh, you know, I don't fully know the answer to that question. I'm sure it in part depends on how well that mask is, is put together, but it certainly 
an interesting idea. Dr. Levy also may want to comment on this question, how people can um, use their time for altruistic ends, and that may be very beneficial both to other people and to the individual, him or herself. Yes, in fact, the research always shows us that people feel more control and much less depressed and much less anxious if they can be helping the cause. And this has been something that we need to remain so isolated that how do you go out there and help, help the cause? But doing things at home, if we learn how to prepare a mask, if we learn how to make hand sanitizer, um, et cetera, we will feel that we are helping. If even we are willing to you know, provide food for, that we've prepared, for people working at hospitals extra hours and provide, I don't know, you know, blankets, whatever they need, whatever the people on the front line need, I think would be very healthy as family projects with young children, with teenagers, with older people. We need to feel we can contribute to this pandemic and to helping the people at greatest risk. Thank you. Um, I have another question. Is it safe for adults in their 60s and 70s to walk outside? And is it safe to sit on park benches? Okay, being outside is just fine, as long as you don't interact with other people. If you do, make sure that the distance is, is six feet or, or more. But there's nothing wrong with being outside. In fact, it's very good. Uh, from the standpoint of both physical and uh, mental health. And I believe it is permitted under the stay-at-home order for people to go outside and, uh, and exercise. Rachel, you might want to want to comment on that. Um, so I would encourage it. Um, if you're concerned about the bench and it's not completely unreasonable, particularly if it's a heavily used bench, then you could bring some wipes with you and wipe down the bench before you sit on it. <laughs> I'm going to just follow up there in that we do know that the vitamin D that is in the air outside is so healthy for us. And the, the, the sunlight is incredibly healthy. So if we are still able to be outside safely with significant distance. I encourage people, especially as the weather is getting nicer, to take their walks. My question here has always been, do you want to take a walk to a park? And for many people, the question has been a beach. Are parks and beach areas any more dangerous than just walking down the street. But in terms of getting outside, sunlight, vitamin D, those are all antidepressants. They are critical. It makes you feel part of the society and not alone. And I'm all for it. Just don't hug your neighbor. Okay. And I'll, we'll do one last question and then, oh, I'm sorry. There, there are two more questions. We'll do those. And then um, I'm going to turn it over to the rabbi to close. So, so next question. Oh, wait. And um, Nani, my daughter, come here, Nani. Do you want to ask your question? Can I hug my Hi, Nani? Dad, Nani wants to know if she can hug me. Yes, because you're in the same household, and that's, that's wonderful. That's very, very good. An unsurprising answer from the grandfather. Yeah. <laughs> So that actually leads to perfectly to the next question, which is, if we've stayed in our homes for two to four weeks before Pesach, is it safe to then go to grandparents if you're feeling fine and you have not been exposed in weeks? Yes, that's a question that's being asked. And if you have been perfectly confined for two weeks, then you should not be uh, the chance that you have the virus at that point would be exceedingly low. So you you might decide to visit uh, grandparents. Now, you people have we have to be careful when we start making exceptions. People tend to bend the rules. And if you started having a large number of people assembling at the grand, grandparents' home, that would not be a good idea. And remember that people over 60, and even more so people over 70, if they get this disease, 
may have really serious problems. So uh, keep that in mind. But if people have really been completely, completely isolated for two weeks, they should be not infectious. Okay. Um, so dad, is it, another question, is the virus infectious to pets and should you take your pets for a walk? Um, it appears that the pets sometimes can have this virus. They don't seem to get sick with it uh, the way we do. We really don't know whether pets can transmit it back to people. We kind of mm -hmm. suspect probably not very much, but it's a somewhat unanswered question. Um, in terms of taking the pet outdoors, I think that's, that's fine. Okay, great. And, and then, um, yeah, one in last term of the health of living with a pet, Rachel, I meant to emphasize that it is very important to interact with your pets right now. And they, they are a part of the family. And I encourage people even to lend their pets if an older person has someone to help them take care of an animal, a small dog, something of the sort. If you have the help, it might be very kind to offer a day with a dog or a cat to someone who's alone. Thank you. And then um, the final question, and then to the rabbi, this was a follow-up about the park bench. Um, someone asked, should you encourage someone to bring a towel or blanket to sit on as the alternative to wiping down the park bench? Well, that's okay too. I think that would be helpful. But if it were your, your own towel, then um, you should wrap it up uh, so that the part of the, when you're done, wrap it up so that the part that was in contact with the bench is inside against each other and the uh, surface that you were on is on the outside and then put it into the washing machine as soon as you get home. Okay, thanks so much. Thank you, Dad, to you and to Dr. Levy. And Rabbi, um, why don't you go ahead and close? Yes, um, thank you uh, all of you um, for joining and, and our presenters, Dr. Storch and Dr. Uh, uh, Shore Levy. It's uh, really a pleasure to have you all. Um, just to conclude, you know, the Torah teaches us that we're always supposed to approach things on two levels, one with the physical and mental precautions, which, uh, which we spent uh, this evening uh, learning about, but also on the spiritual plane, I thought maybe it would be appropriate if we could just uh, recite one psalm uh, together, one chapter of Tehillim, which, is, uh, which should be said in merit of all those who are ill, and those who are um, in, in the continuing safety of, of all of us. So I have it over here. Could, is it, are you able to see or is it? Uh... Yes, that's just fine. If you lift it up a little bit. Okay. Is this okay? Yes, we can yes, see it. A little higher. Okay. So I'm going to uh, read it and if everyone could kindly read along with me. Shir Lamalos, Asa Enai El Harim, my Ayin Yavo Ezri. Ezri me im Adunai, Ose Shamaim Vaaretz. Ayitain Lamot Raglacha, Al Yanum Shomeracha. Hine Lo Yanum Velo Yishan, Shomer Yisrael. Adonai Shomeracha. Adonai Tzelecha al Yadi Minecha, Yom HaMashem HaShelo Yekeka, Vayareach Balayla. Adonai Yishmorcha Mikol Ra, Yishmor Es Nafshecha, Adonai Yishmor Tzeitzcha Vorecha, Meata Biyad Olam. Please God, everyone should have a health and safety, and as always, um, if uh, we could do anything for you, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out. And I want to thank Rachel for organizing and, mon and moderating this a wonderful uh, uh, program. Thank you all so much, and have a wonderful evening. Thank you all. Good night. Good night. Betsy, I'm going to ask one more question that came in. I hadn't seen it. If someone is newly stressed, how would mm -hmm. they seek psychological help online if they don't currently have a relationship with a therapist? Well, you, you could absolutely go on to Psychology Today or zencare.com and look for a therapist nearby who works, let's say, with your insurance or not with your insurance, reach out to them. There, there are ways to email and say you are a new patient looking for help and that while it's not the best of circumstances to do the work only by phone when you have not met, it's better than nothing, and they should ask for a Skype session or a video session. Um, there are many, many ways to
find psychologists, social workers, and psychiatrists in the community. It's all over the internet. And for anyone who is looking for help, I can certainly provide referrals to you, Rachel. And you can give a list of people in our community who I know would be happy to see new patients who do not have a history of psychotherapy, but do need help with the stress induced by COVID-19. Okay, wonderful. I'm sorry to do that after we had closed, but no I- No problem, it's a very important well. point. Okay, thanks so much, everyone. Have a wonderful night and stay safe and healthy. Good. Same to you. Bye.